Hey, everybody, welcome back to the High Performance Zone. Today, we are going deep into self-discipline, but self-discipline with meditation and confidence. This is Giovanni. I'm going to call him the Lion Detsman. He's an expert on this. In fact, one of the biggest takeaways I took from this was no matter what, be on your own side. And that's a mindset, by the way. Be on your own side no matter what. Okay, a lot more gold in here. Ready? Hit it. Giovanni! Gucci here. Hey, thanks for being on the show. Hey, Gucci. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, that, that, that's going to make a lot, a lot more sense here soon. Hey, you know what? I know you've done a ton of uh, self-discipline behind the scenes. What's the mental mindset that works in top performers? What's the one trait that you see in any top performer? You know, that's a great question. And these top performers, they will call this trait different things. Some of yeah. them will say it's perseverance. It's uh, showing up, it's willpower. I like to call it self-discipline. That self-discipline is this meta skill that includes both the skill of awareness and the skill of willpower. And everyone who has reached the top of their field, whatever that is, they have self-discipline. Yeah, 100%. Let's unpack now self-awareness and, uh, and willpower. What, what's your definition of those two terms? Absolutely. So... Self-awareness is for you to be aware of what are your values, what are your aspirations, where are you heading, what do you actually want for yourself and for your life. And not only going through an exercise and taking note of that and keeping that into a drawer, but actually, you know, thinking about that every day, starting your day, thinking about your goals and values, and then thinking about it during the day, using that as a compass for your decisions. And at the end of the, your day, you journal about it, making sure that you're living aligned with those values. So that is the skill of awareness. In a way, you can say it is to remember what's important, to stay connected with what's important. The other aspect of awareness, and that comes more from the meditation point of view, and I'm originally a meditation teacher, is that awareness gives you space. It gives you some space between you and your thoughts, between you and your emotions, your impulses, your triggers, your memories. And when you have space, then you have freedom. That space is the space of your freedom. Because if your thoughts are pointing left, if the pressures of the moment are pointing left, if your emotions is telling you to go left, but you know in that moment that your values are pointing right, you can go right if you have that space. But if you have no space, then you're just living out the conditioned life. Your triggers are determining your actions and then you're not really free. So that yeah, is the I value of self-awareness. No, I'm with, I'm with you 100% there. I like to say it's that gap between the stimulus and the response, right? So that space that you're talking about is uh, can, can be very short, but you can train your mind to capture that, right? So you're not just reacting, you're actually responding. Absolutely. And that is the space of awareness. And we train yeah. that through meditation practice, through yep. journaling and self-reflection, and through some other awareness tools. You know, Aristotle then, has said that wisdom is experience plus reflection. So if you're just going through life, but we're not stopping to think about things and to reflect, then we're not really growing. Oh, I love that. Was, did you say that was Aristotle? Wisdom is, yes. is experience plus reflection. That's right. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I love that. I love the, the whole quest on wisdom, right? And, uh, uh, and I also love the word freedom you use there. You know, I think wisdom gets us freedom. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, you said that. Hey, tell me more about willpower now. So that's the self-awareness piece. What's the willpower piece? So willpower is your capacity to live life aligned with your values. It's your capacity to go and do the thing that is difficult, the thing that makes you feel uncomfortable, but it's the thing that is going to be a plus one in your life. And maybe that is saying no to the donuts and going for the yeah. apple. Maybe that's saying no to snoozing and waking up the time you have decided. Maybe that's saying yes to doing your taxes now when you don't feel like doing your taxes. Whatever it is that is going to be a plus one in your life, it's going to take some effort because your emotions is probably telling you to go one way while your values is pointing the other way. Nice, nice. You know, it, it reminds me of, of just the, the the basic question of why are we here, you know, and answering that for yourself. That um, you mentioned it earlier, uh, really getting a clear understanding of uh, why are you here. Uh, how do you address that? 
Like, why are you here? Why are you here? <laughs> I'm here to allow people to live with more awareness and willpower so they can live more fulfilling lives. And what that means for each person depends on them. You know, you have your sense of purpose. I have my sense of purpose. Many people out there don't have a sense of purpose yet. And then they have to start that journey. But if you are, a, you know, a caterpillar has to become a butterfly. That is its purpose in life. The seed of an oak tree must become an oak tree. And so I believe that each one of us has a seed of purpose and meaning, a mission inside of us. And if we embrace that, however difficult that is, we will find happiness and fulfillment. But if we don't, we won't. Oh, I'm with you 100%. I love, I love the idea of a seed, right? And the, the example, right? From a little seed, you can get this massive oak tree. Um, what do you say when people aren't sure of what that purpose is? How do you help them find that? Mm. In mindful self-discipline, there are several questions that we go through to help clarify that. And different people will respond better to different questions. But one thing is to see what is your greatest pain. Your mm. pain often equals your purpose. You know, the thing that really upsets you, the thing that you want to make sure doesn't happen to you or to anyone else. That's probably where there is a lot of energy for you to work and go very far. So that is one question that we can use. Another question is, what did you want to, go to do when you were a kid? What was your dream? Before you got indoctrinated in society's way, ways, before you kind of lost everything and just, just got a job, like what were you dreaming? What do you often think about and are passionate about? Something that you would do even without being paid for. All of these are different questions that can help us see what matters most to us. Oh, I love, I love your first one. I mean, the second one is, is kind of the obvious one, right? You know, uh, well, what do you love? What's your dream and all that? I like the way you went at, but I've never thought about what you just said. And that is, well, go into your pain. What's giving you challenges? Um, because we're there to learn from them, right? I mean, I believe, and I think you do too, that these challenges are there for us to learn from. And uh, tell me more about how do you, um, how do you go into your pain and not make it a downward spiral? How do you take something that's a challenge that actually becomes your greatest gift? Right. So imagine that someone has um, suffered bullying when yeah. they were a kid Good. at home or at school, whatever. So that can be, for some people, that's something that they just kind of brush off and move on. For other people, it kind of stick with them and becomes a part of their personality, how their, their sense of the world is formed. And so different people who have gone through that same traumatic experience can turn that into a sense of purpose that is very, very different. For one person, maybe he wants to be a lawyer uh, to help uh, protect uh, kids or people. Another person may want to become a politician to create new regulations. Another person may want to become a psychologist, a counselor. Someone may want to go to MMA and beat the, the crap out of other people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so the same painful experience can turn into a different sense of purpose for different people according to their own personalities, idiosyncrasies. Um, but if when you go and you can touch that that sense of pain and use that for your own betterment and for the betterment of the world, that's when you feel like you are, you have found your place in life. Yeah. Yeah. Giving, using your own experiences to be of help to others. Let's, let's take that. I like the bully, bully example. What about if you, um, if you didn't have a good childhood, what happens if, cause we hear so many times that people um, have an abusive parent, let's say, or they perceive them as abusive. It may not even be the case. What, what does someone do about that? Mm. And so the way we process that experience makes the whole difference. Some people may not have the, the support or, or, or the mindset to process that experience in a positive way. Right. And so you know, they can easily end up in crime or addiction or just feel no motivation to do anything in their life, feel depressed, like nothing really matters. While other people, they feel... Um, there's almost like a sense of, of, of anger inside of them that they say like, no, this is not okay. And I want to make sure that, you know, I, I, I heal myself and I come out on top of this. I, may, I want to make sure that other people don't have to go through the same thing that I can go through. There is this very influential um, psychologist and philosopher, Abraham La Maslow. And he oh, yeah. said, um, swallow your demons 
and they will give you their power. Oh, I didn't know Maslow said that. Okay, that's um, swallow your demons and they'll give you your power. Give me a practical example of that. Let's say you have depression. Let's say that's the demon, right? How does that, how do you swallow that? Something inside of you rebels against that and rejects the idea that I am going to be depressed forever. Something inside of you says, no, I, I, I have to get out of here. I, I have to figure out a way. And then you don't stop until you do. But if something inside of you just kind of breaks and feels like, you know what, I guess this is my life, then you just continue. Then you become a victim. And in the victim mindset, there's, there's no way out to change that mindset. Because in that mindset, you don't see yourself as someone powerful. You don't see yourself as someone who can make a change. Mm -hmm. And when I'm saying powerful, I don't mean power over other people. Right. I'm saying empowered. And that's why in, in my work, I use the image of, of a lion that is meditating. You know, that lion is incredibly powerful, but he's also peaceful. He is meditating. Empowered peace. Yeah, I, I love the lion. We were beforehand, you know, Sugar, my producer, always likes to give call signs. Your, your call sign is now lion. Uh, and hey, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, oh, heck yeah, that's a great call sign. Most people don't get cool call signs. Um, so let's let's unpack that. Um, you were just starting to. What's the metaphor around the lion and uh, mm -hmm. how do you see it? Right. Yeah. So, you know, my background is a lot into meditation. I have been practicing meditation daily for 23 years. I almost became a, a, a Buddhist monk at a certain point in my, in my journey. How and long ago was that? How long ago was that? <laughs> I was 19 at that time. So that was a long time ago. Okay. <laughs> um, and what I've noticed in the world of meditation is that there is too much emphasis on just being in the moment, accepting, mm -hmm. letting go, and kind of being content no matter what. And these are important skills but they are only half of the story. Yeah. For me, meditation was always more about self-mastery, was about me knowing myself and being in a sense of being empowered within myself. And so that's where I coined the term empowered peace, that I'm not interested in the peace of a graveyard yet. Yeah, nothing bothers me, but like, what do I do? What, where do I get from here? I'm interested in a peace that is more dynamic, that is more energized, right? So... I emphasize as a meditation teacher and as a coach, I emphasize the idea of living with purpose, the idea of awareness and willpower. And that's a bit of a different message from what we see um, among many meditation teachers. Yeah, you know, meditation now, it's such a, a big thing in the in the corporate world. It's, it's gaining traction. Wasn't that long ago. Um, and now, now is, you know, mindfulness. Everybody talks about mindfulness. Um, how do you differentiate between mindfulness and meditation? Yeah, so that's a, that's a tricky question and a very common one as well. It depends on how we understand the term mindfulness. So mindfulness can be understood to be a practice, to be um, a trait, to be um, a quality of your mind. So if you see it as a practice, as a particular technique, then that is one of many meditation techniques. And it's one that comes from the Buddhist tradition. And people teach it in different ways, but it's kind of a meditation technique. Now, if you think of it as... Um, a quality, then mindfulness is that quality of being aware, of being present, of noticing. And that's how I use this term in my work. Mindful self-discipline is self-discipline based on awareness. Yeah, I love that. And, and presence, right? Could be another word, this awareness and being present in the moment. Talk to me a little bit more about what presence means in your scope of uh, study. Right. So presence means that you are in the eye of the storm. That you, there may be a storm around you, but you are, there's something in you that is not moving and you are aware of what's happening. When you are aware of what's happening, then there's already a sense of control. Neuroscience uh, teaches us that if you simply name your feelings, name the emotions that you're feeling in the moment, there is already a bit of space. We come back to this theme of space. There's already a bit of space between you and that emotion that is already objectified. So that emotion doesn't occupy the whole screen of consciousness anymore. Yeah. Because when the, when the emotion, when anger comes, for example, and occupies the whole screen of consciousness, there's not much we can do. Yeah. Right? You, you are a victim to your own anger. 
But if there is some space, if there is presence, and you can see like anger is here. And you don't tell yourself, I am angry. You right. say anger is here. Anger, anger has arise. And that is that shows that space that exists inside yourself. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Doing a lot of uh, study and research on the parts of uh, of a person or the parts of your brain, right? And you and I are, are talking that idea of there's multiple parts, right? And uh, and and what we label, like when you use the I am statement, boy, I'm with you. You know, I love the I am statement in a positive way, um, but you sure don't want to label your I am uh, in a negative way. At least I don't think. What do you mm -hmm. think about that? I am is the core of our identity and whatever we attach to I am becomes our identity. Right. So if you say I am sad, then well, you, you are saying that it's part of your identity. Yeah. And, and how do you, how do you answer the question where people just need to feel what they really feel? You know, this idea of um, not rejecting, how, how, what's, what's the right question? This idea, you, you know what I'm asking, right? This idea of, Oh no! You 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 got to go into your sadness. If you're sad, go into your sadness. Uh, how do you respond to that? What's your teachings tell you? So that's a, a common teaching in the world of uh, mindfulness and therapy. Yeah. And in general, it's something that I I agree with, with some caveats here and there. You know what they're talking against is the idea of suppressing your emotions, right? Just um, putting things under the rug. Okay, and that doesn't work because it. Um, it comes out in a different way. It's, it shape shifts into something else. You think that you got rid of that in your, and then it comes again into your life and then you have to deal with it because you haven't dealt with it in the first place. So the skill of mindfulness is that you can just be with that emotion and that's okay. Yeah. And, you know, and even this is an expression of empowerment that if you cannot be with an emotion, if you have to run away, then who is in control here? The emotion is in control. But if anxiety can be here, and I can also be here and I don't need to move and I don't need to worry. And I can look at my anxiety in, at, at her face and say, you know what? You can stay here for as long as you want. I don't uh -huh. mind. Now that's a state of empowerment. And that comes from presence. When you need to fight your emotions, it means that you, you haven't learned how to just be the witness of them. Nice. Nice. So um, tell, let's go back into your background. You've got some deep, uh, training here. It's coming out in a very beautiful way. What What is your background? And uh, yeah, take us through. And by the way, you got a German accent, right? Where are, are you in Germany right now? Where do you live? Well, I'm actually in Brazil. I was born and raised in Brazil, but my family, some generations ago, they migrated from Germany. That's yeah. why I have a German um, surname. Yeah. yeah, I'm currently in Brazil, but I, I live in Australia. That's my permanent place. Oh, nice. Wow. It's it's what time is it in Australia right now? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm right now I'm in Brazil, so it's uh, 6 okay. p.m. Yes. Okay, good, good. I didn't want you to be up too late. Um, I appreciate <laughs> you, you being here. Um, yeah, but let's, let's go. You know, I was actually born in Germany. I was born in uh, Würzburg, uh, okay. but you were born in Brazil. Okay, it's just yes. German answer. Okay, got it. So, but, but give me more of your background. I mean, how do you, you know, 19, you almost became a monk. Um, what did you study? You know, take me through that journey line. Right. So as a teenager, I had a lot of um, restlessness inside of me and I didn't know what it was about. And when I started knowing that there is such thing as meditation, you know, I wanted to read everything about it. And I tried different styles of meditation and, you know, I felt something very special. The first time I went um, to a meditation workshop and they guided me into meditation, I went into a place inside myself that I didn't know existed. A what place that... What did that feel like? Right. So a place where um, there was, um, I was just happy and peaceful here and now. Mm. No need to go anywhere or to run away from anything or to run after anything. That there was this place inside of me that was just still. And that was um, a very unique experience for me. And yeah. so I remember that day, I kind of made a vow to myself that I'll continue meditating every day for the rest of my life. That's a powerful vow. Um, two questions. One is, what type of meditation did they guide you through? What was that? So that was a meditation group called Brahma Kumaris. Um, their guided meditation is not so well known in, in the West, but um, they're, they're, try, they're trying to guide you directly to a state of no mind, of being beyond thoughts. 
But then after that, I went into Zen Buddhism. I studied that for three years. So I was doing the Zen meditation. Then I did the non-dual meditation practices for nine years. And then I moved on to the practices of yoga and Tantra. And I um, did experiment with a lot of different techniques in that field. Nice. What um, Now, for, for those of us who maybe haven't had your breadth of experience with meditation, let's unpack them briefly. What's the mm-hmm. difference? And more importantly, what's the benefits that you got out of these different types? It's not like one's better than the other necessarily, but what, um, what are the benefits that someone could learn from, from your experiences? Right. So the key takeaway from, from all of this for me is that these meditations, they are actually very different. They do have a lot of common benefits. You know, there are a lot of research on the benefits of meditation. Yes, all of them will lower your blood pressure and they're going to be good for your body and help you relax, etc. So all of them do that. But there's a lot of difference in the experience in the meditation itself and the results that they bring. Just like you can, you can train your body 10 hours a week on different things and it will lead to different results. If you spend 10 hours a week doing bodybuilding, it's different from a person who spent 10 hours a week running or swimming or playing basketball. They That's lead a great to analogy. Different... That's right. a great analogy. So let's go to um, that first meditation. What was it called again that you were guided through? The... Well, that what, uh, the one that I learned is not the one that I practiced for any length of time, but we can talk, for example, about uh, Buddhist meditation or yeah, uh, Zen, right? Zen. The Zen Buddhist meditation. So, um, in Zen, one of the, the practices that is emphasized a lot is the idea of just observing whatever is happening in the present moment, right? So that's a practice of mindfulness. And here the awareness is in a way shallow but wide. So anything that is coming to your awareness, a sound, a thought, a sensation, itchiness in the body, a memory, you know, a thought, you kind of are aware of everything. You're not picking and choosing. You let everything come and you let everything go. That's one of the ways in which they practice meditation in Zen. And that trains a very particular skill of the mind. Now, all the meditations that I did after that were concentration-based meditations. And that's actually the opposite. While in observation, your awareness is shallow and wide, in concentration, your awareness is narrow and deep. You're focusing all your attention on a single object moment after moment. And so that trains a different area of the brain that trains a different skill and we need them both. So depending on what you need from meditation, what you want to experience from meditation, you would choose one style or another. A person who uh, wants to be more focused, more motivated, more energized, I would say go for concentration meditation. Mm. A person who is struggling with negative emotions, impulsivity, I would say go more for an observation meditation. And then, of course, there are a hundred of different variables there. It's not possible for me to create a formula for everybody. But um, the, what I can say to the, to the general public is, you know, spend some time experimenting with different styles of meditation and journal how they affect you and, and see which one works best for you. Yeah, and get a good teacher, right? I mean, that's, that's the key. I think that's a shortcut. Is, yeah, there you go. Someone who really knows. Uh, that. So what have you, um, how has your meditation practice grown? You say you've done it every day. Um, does it vary in length? And uh, yeah, give me your, what, what have you learned? What is your takeaway? So I started doing 20 minutes okay. a day, five days a week. And then soon I increased to six and seven days a week. And, um, you know, I increased my practice from 20 minutes to one hour and it stayed at one hour for a very long time. Until, you know, the time that I was quitting my job and becoming more of a full-time meditation teacher, then I embraced the practice even more and made it longer. So nowadays I I practice around three hours every day, but that's not, you know, it's not for everybody. It's like, if you want to, if you want to teach other people to play tennis, you better play a lot of tennis and and be good at what you do as an example. I love that. What, what, what is your practice as far as timing? Do you do it first thing? Um, What time a you know, I mean, obviously there's lots of different ways. What I'm trying to do is unpack what's worked for you. What's the magic that's worked for you? <laughs> um, and this has changed over time. So I keep on experimenting. I just don't go one way and, and keep nice. it. I keep on tinkering. For me, uh, the, the best time of the day is early in the morning. 
before breakfast, before everyone else wakes up in the house, before anything else, before you go online and check your phone, yeah. before you allow the world to come into your life, you just have that space for yourself. In yeah. terms of timing, that's what I found works best. And would you recommend most people start with 20 minutes? Um, I mean, obviously, if you can get to an hour, but uh, what, what do you recommend? What do you teach for mm -hmm. beginners? It depends on how, it depends if they have already had experience in meditation or not and how much discipline they have. Yeah. But for many people, I say start with five minutes and increase Good. one minute a week. Nice. Nice. I like that. Let's get back to self-discipline. Um, I'm so involved in, you know, in, in the different techniques and stuff, but, um, you know, I think that's key. You got a new book coming out, right? What's, what's the title of this new book? So that is wise confidence, wise confidence. And talk to me about that. What's the premise behind the book? So the idea is that confidence is a virtue and every virtue casts a shadow. Every virtue can be excessive if you don't balance it nice. and many people who don't have self-confidence who are afraid of becoming more confident and embracing self-belief they are afraid that they will become arrogant conceited that they would just throw caution out of the wind and take uh, meaningless risks in their life and that is an expression of overconfidence when that virtue of confidence is unbalanced then it can actually be more of a liability than an asset yeah so in wise confidence, I talk about having that balance. Self-doubt is one extreme and overconfidence is the other extreme. And in the middle, I call it wise confidence, that it is wise to believe in yourself, to be on your own side, no matter what happens. Mm -hmm. But it's also wise to be cautious and to know your weaknesses and to work through them. Yeah, beautiful. I like what you said, be on your own side, no matter what. Um, so powerful, you know, uh, it, it's really mastery on oneself first, right? Before you can master anything else. And, and I think that's a huge self-talk, you know, that a lot of people have struggled with, right? They have negative self-talk and, um, tell me more about what does that mean to you? You're always on your side. Mm -hmm. Um, yet you may, you know, you may have made a mistake, but, but right. how, how do you, yeah. How do you, <laughs> how do you define that? Yeah, and I love that you bring this up. Uh, being always on my side doesn't mean that, um, you know, if, if I have a fight with my wife that I'm always on my side and I'm always right. right and there's no discussion. <laughs> That's not what it means. Being always on my side means that um, whatever I undertake in my life, I choose to believe that I can do it. I choose to believe that it's possible. If I fail, I choose to still be on my side and to still mm -hmm. keep working towards my goal. Doesn't matter how many times I fail. It doesn't matter if the whole world is against me. If something inside of me says, this is you, this is you do you, you know, this is your aspiration, this matters, then I will continue doing that. And that is being on my side. It means to believe in your capacity. It doesn't mean that you think like, okay, I'm going to start this new thing. I'm going to start a business and I'm so great. It's going to be a piece of cake. No, it means that you have a healthy dose of respect for the challenges in the way, but you also trust yourself no matter what and you believe that whatever happens i know i can figure things out i if there's a skill i don't have i know i can develop it. if there's a knowledge i don't have i can acquire or i can get a mentor i can get help i can do this yeah i love i love it. do you do you say it starts with that self belief um is that true and then what's the next step once you have acquired that so self confidence has five elements Self-belief is the core, it's, oh. and it's the opposite of self-doubt. Yep. Then we also have um, determination, integrity, um, courage, and optimism. So um, you want me to go through? Them yeah, 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 yeah. Give me okay. your, your take on those words because, you know, mm -hmm. the, they're big words, right? And, right. Uh, and, then, and then tie in the lion aspect to it. I, I want to see that, but go for it. <laughs> okay. So uh, we talked about self-belief, so integrity. Integrity comes from the word, word integer, which means one. Integrity is to be one. So the opposite of being one is being divided. When you're doubting yourself, you are divided. Part of you wants to do something, part of you says you can't. So there is that inner conflict inside of you. When there is integrity, the whole of you, you were talking about parts a moment ago, the whole of you is moving forward. 
That is integrity. Otherwise, it can feel like you're trying to move forward with a handbrake on. It's going to take a lot of energy, a lot of fuel, and you may not go very far. So integrity means that you do that inner work so that all parts of you, conscious and subconscious, want the same thing and are moving the same direction. So oh, that like, is integrity. Yeah, no, I love that. With the subconscious and the conscious. So what we're talking about here is that your whole being, you know, is in oneness with who you are. How does that, um, how does that equate to, let's say, uh, a marriage or a work environment? When you say you are in integrity or integral with yourself, give me an example of when that's true and when it's not. So if you are in a journey of health, you want to take care of your health and you want to uh, live long and get fit and all of that, there could be, as there is for millions of people, there could be an inner conflict inside of you that your conscious mind is saying like, yes, I want this goal. I'm trying really hard. I don't know why I'm failing, but I, I, you know, I want this. But there's a part of you and that is subconscious or even unconscious that that part of you doesn't want that goal. The part of you is afraid of that goal. And it could be fear of failure, that if I try and I actually fail, then there's no excuse, then that's embarrassing. It could be fear of success for some people, that if I succeed, I will be a different person and I may lose my friends or people may think of me differently or it's a new identity, I don't know if I will like that. It could be fear of the journey, that you know this will require effort and commitment and sacrifice and I'm not sure I'm up for it. Mm -hmm. So when there is a division in your being that part of you wants something and another part of you doesn't, it's usually because of fear in different forms. And until we solve that fear, it's going to be really hard. You can get the best coach, the best program, the best books, the best everything. But if part of you doesn't want, then that part will make sure that, you know, you get sick the night before the exam or you break your leg before you run or something's going to happen. Yeah. Now that's assuming you're even aware that you're afraid, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and let's say someone is. Let's say somebody goes, okay, uh, I'm 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 fighting myself. I have fear. Uh, what's what's your next step? How do you overcome that fear? You have to really understand what you're afraid of, and you have to dialogue with that part of yourself and see if you can. Neg negotiate if you can get that part to be on the same team not in an imposing way like hey let go of this fear let's just do this this is better that's not going to work um, and this is where the the more internal aspect of the work that usually happens in coaching or therapy or um, other personal growth processes usually happens and and this part of the path is very unique for every person what i can say that is true for everybody is uh, learn to identify if there is a contradiction in your being, if there is resistance or self-sabotage. Mm -hmm. And then the first step is to become aware of that. Try to become as aware as possible of why does that part of me doesn't want this goal? Yeah, that's that's huge. Okay, good. Um, let's go on to the other ones because you got some okay. good stuff going here. So integrity, got Integrity it? and self-belief, uh, then courage. You know, confidence and courage, they are two sides of the same coin in a way. When you take bold steps forward, you are betting on yourself. You are telling yourself, your subconscious mind, your nervous system, that you can go through risks and still be successful. You're, you're not gonna be courageous if you don't think that you can face the fear. And so an act of courage is an act of confidence. It's much easier for you to believe in yourself when you demonstrate that through action by taking risks. And the very fact of facing fear is already an exercise of confidence that, you know what, this is, this place is very scary for me, but I'm choosing to go through this because it's important. And I believe I can go through this fear and survive. Yeah. You know, I, I love the word scary. I mean, it's just a, it's a play on nuance on words, but like, I like to say, uh, I'm scared all the time. I don't mind being scared, but I'm not afraid. You know, mm -hmm. to me, that's where I differentiate between fear and being aware in a, in a good way. How do you like to differentiate that? How would you explain it? So some people um, use different words like courage and bravery. So when you're brave, you just have no fear. 
when you're courage, you have the fear, but you still take action. Right. Um, and so for me, being afraid means that you're, you're feeling the fear. Well, I, I like the way you use those words and I will be comfortable using them in that way also. I think that that works. It's um, different people add different meanings to the word. So when I'm coaching yeah. someone, if I notice that this work doesn't work, we're going to go and use a different word that works. Yeah, yeah. No, I like that. I, I've never heard the difference between bravery and courage that you define. I, mm -hmm. I've heard the courage definition a lot. You know, you're you're still uh, fears there, but you have the courage to go through it. You proceed through it. Where bravery, you said you're you're fearless. I guess I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. Anyhow, it's just definitions. But I like I like that we're able to to get some nuances here. Okay, uh, what's after courage? So then we have uh, optimism. Optimism. Optimism is the opposite of, of negativity. So negativity, meaning if you think that things are not going to work out, if you anticipate that um, you're going to fail, um, it's very hard to be confident. Yeah. But when you anticipate that, hey, this can work, I, I can learn this, I can be successful at this, then you naturally believe in yourself. And we're not talking about being blindly optimistic here which is what happens when you are in overconfidence. You just think that everything is going to work. It's going to be no problem. And uh, Mike Tyson's uh, coach used to say, everyone has a plan until they're punched in the face. Yeah, and, yeah. That's, <laughs> and that's life. So um, optimism, I, I like to talk about smart optimism, which is I recognize that there is a sea of possibilities in front of me. And I'm aware that I don't know what's going to happen. And I cannot know. But I would choose to believe that the that what I want to happen is possible. And I choose to believe that if I believe in myself and I work hard and I am consistent and disciplined, that that can happen. And that is optimism. It's possible. Uh, now, I love that because people sometimes challenge this idea of optimism as not being reality. So how do you answer that question? I heard a... Um, a research done a while ago with, um, I think it was 20 or 30 billionaires, if they consider themselves optimists or pessimists. And um, I think just one of them considered themselves a pessimist. Everyone else considers themselves an optimist. It's that. And there's this saying that um, pessimists are more often right, but <laughs> optimists are more often successful and happy. Oh, that's a good, that's a good one. Yeah, uh, pessimists are more often right? But optimists are more successful or happy, huh? That's, mm. that's cool. And you say there's a, there's a study on that with. Yes. So I can't quote that. I, I yeah. heard this in a podcast ages ago, yeah. but I might be able to, to find it. No, that's great. That's great. What, um, uh, as we think about, you know, optimism, um, how would you respond to this? I believe the world's coming from us, not at us. So what does that mean to you? <laughs> Well, the, the first thought that comes to mind is that uh, what you see around you is a reflection of who you are inside of you. Okay. And uh, I think that there's a lot of truth to that. I think that thinking this way helps you to always reflect on how am I contributing to my reality? And everyone is contributing to their reality more than they suspect. Yeah. And so That's I think that. that this is a very helpful way of thinking. Uh, but it's something that can be used negatively also. You know, um, Maybe. when you are interacting with toxic people and uh, eventually go and point out something in their behavior that is not kind or that is very selfish or what it is, you know, they could easily say, you know what, if you see that in yourself, it's coming from you. <laughs> it's yeah, not yeah. from me. So that could be used as an excuse to also um, not address certain things. We always have to be aware of the two sides of the coin. I like that. Yeah, that's good. That's good. The um, I think what we're really talking about it, and you mentioned this earlier, is the idea of karma or cause and effect, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, the seeds we plant are going to come back to us. So, uh, I think you mentioned earlier, earlier, if you plant an oak tree, you're only going to get an oak tree. You're not going to get a peach tree, right? Right. Um, and uh, and the same thing with you know good deeds. You do a good deed, it's going to come back to you. Um, but here's the here's the challenge is that aspect of time, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Can we really label the cause and the effect? How do you, how do you think <laughs> about that? Uh, the idea of cause and effect and, and how you, you teach to that? Right. 
And so every event has so many causes and we can only speculate, like if I remove that cause, would it still happen or not? We don't know. We would have to run that through a computer, computer somewhere or maybe in a parallel universe, if I had make, made a little choice different in my past, would I be a completely different person or kind of the same? We can't know, we can just speculate. But um, you know, in, in, my, in my life as a meditation teacher and also as a practitioner of these ancient wisdom traditions, I believe in the idea of karma. I believe that the best long-term strategy for life in general is to do the right thing, is to do the good thing, is to give more than you receive. Yeah. And at the very least, you will feel clean and, and, and satisfied and, and proud of the life you lived. Yeah, I love that. I love the idea of give uh, to receive, right? Um, I, I kind of have a mantra, learn, grow, give. Every morning I wake up, I say, what can I learn? How can I grow? And more importantly, how can I give? Um, mm -hmm. how, what kind of mantras do you like? I mean, you've done a lot of study. So which mantras resonate with your heart and why? So the way that I use mantras is more the traditional way that comes from, you know, the the masters of meditation in India. And in that sense, it's not mantra as an affirmation, it's mantra as a, as a sound vibration. And many of them don't have a particular meaning. So um, the way I practice meditation is, the bulk of it is mantra meditation. There are also some other styles. What but you um, it, you, you, currently that's your, that's your practice, yes. mantra yes. meditation? Oh, mantra I love meditation. that. Yeah. I didn't know yeah. that, I didn't know that. Yes. So, yes. and, and it's more of trying to resonate with the chakras, trying to get that, that sound vibration or, or am I wrong? What, what, what do you like? No. So the idea in, the, in this tradition is that everything in the universe is vibration okay. and sound is vibration. So everything in the universe kind of has a sound or is a sound. And when you repeat a particular sound on and on every day, day after day, you are creating a new pattern in your consciousness, in your mind and in your body. And like this, there can be a transformation of your consciousness, a transformation of your body, of your way of being. So, I mean, I know one uh, that I like to use all the time, and I, I'm, I'm wondering if you're willing to share, you know, I like to go, Om Ahum, Om Ahum. That's one that I was taught that that resonates with me. And when I do that, and I'm doing a, a yoga, I also like to do yoga, um, I, I'll integrate it. And when I when and I had a podcast and he, he said, the person said, you know, the, the symbol, ah, he said, when you look, if you look up, when you say, ah, it's like, ah, you know, it's like why Michelangelo painted this, the, the paintings on the, on the ceiling, right? Because mm -hmm. you get this, you get this sense of awe, right? Mm -hmm. With the sound, ah, and I thought that was cool, whether it's true or not, I'm not hundred percent sure, but Hey, it, it works for me. What, what works for you? What can you share? some mantras that, that you've seen that are helpful for others? Right. Um, I, can, I can share a mantra that is uh, universally taught by anyone who is beginning in mantra practice. And that is the mantra, so hum. So, so hum. And typically how this is done is you coordinate this mantra with your breath. So as you're breathing in, you're saying so, you're repeating so in your mind. And as you're breathing out, you're repeating hum in your mind. And you just go like this, uh, focusing on the in and out of the breath and coordinating that with the sound. And then that's a beginner's practice. And later on, you can layer other things as you are imagining that the breath is going in and uh, up and down your spine. And later you're doing some visualizations. But um, in general, that's, that's a mantra that anyone can, can try. And the other one is simply the mantra OM. Yeah. You can imagine that you are um, vibrating that mantra OM in the space between your eyebrows, which is known as the third eye. And that is connected to the pineal gland in the brain. So, you know, you close your eyes and you kind of focus all your awareness in the space between your eyebrows. It's almost as if your whole being was, was suddenly there. And then you, you repeat the mantra OM. It could be in your mind or you could be whispering it. Om, om, as you like, whatever speed is comfortable for you. And you imagine that it's the mantra is vibrating here as a pulsation. And um, if that practice connects with you, you will, you will go to a, a place of stillness and peace very quickly. Yeah, I feel that all the time. For this happens to me. And, and tell me if, 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 if you find this, you know, I feel that pulsing and it almost feels like the universe. You know, if you were to look out into the space, 
um, this idea of, um, of, of a pulse and it, it grows, you know, as the deeper I go, uh, sometimes I get some white lights coming and I'm not sure which direction they're coming. Um, and it's kind of cool. Now that's just my experience. Uh, mm -hmm. what are some that you've had with that, that idea of focusing on the third eye? Right. So, you know, this experience of seeing lights or seeing images in front of your closed eyes, we often call this the, the mind screen. So when you close your eyes and you see just black, that's the mind screen. But as you're doing meditation and focus on a particular spot, you may start seeing images in your mind screen. And um, this experience of seeing lights is actually a good one. You know, most meditation teachers and traditions will say, yeah, you just ignore that. Just uh, It's nothing, just stay with the sound. But uh, I would say, no, if you see that light, focus on that light. Yeah. And see if you can make that stable. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I like that too. Um, great. Hey, what? Um, this has been really light. I'm having a ball. I'm sure. Hope uh, <laughs> other people are are learning as much as I am. Um, let's, you know, make sure. Uh, did we not hit on something that you think is really important for your practice for people who? Um, and, and how can they get a hold of you? I want to make sure they know where they can go because you're you're full of wisdom and, and a lot of techniques too. So. Uh, what do you think? Well, the, the only thing that we haven't touched on is the fifth element of self-confidence. Good memory. <laughs> that is determination. Okay. Now, determination is in a way a synonym for willpower. And what is the opposite of determination is hesitation. It's um, weakness. It's inertia. When you are determined, it means that you have decided that this thing must happen. When you're determined to succeed, it means you have decided that I must succeed at this thing and I'm not going to accept failure. If I fall down a hundred times, I'm going to get up 101 times, but I will not give up. I am determined to succeed. And when you feel this, you are, you are filled with power and you're filled with confidence. And, you know, and there's, um, a beautiful word for this in the English language that unfortunately has been um, lost its power because people don't do it properly anymore. It's the word resolution. When you make a resolution, another word uh, is resolve. That's not used as often. But when you make yeah. a resolution that, you know what, I, I have to fix this thing or I have to get this thing or I have to improve this. I have to make it. Determination has the sense of I have to. And this is not the I have to of someone imposing it. Right. To yourself, right? It's not a conditioning. It's that sense. It comes from within you. It's you don't have any plan B because plan A must work. Right. And if it must work, then you will show up with the best of you. And then it will work because you, yeah, there's no other option. Yeah, it, there's another thought there. Um, Shackleton, you know, the idea of burning the boats, right? I don't know if you exactly. know that analogy. He, they get marooned in the Antarctic or the Arctic. I think it's the Antarctic, right? And uh, and then he burns the boats. So they they, they got to hike out. There's no way right. of getting back, right? right? Um, that's a scary thing to do in real life. I mean, give me an example where you've actually done that. Okay, I'll, I'll give you a very simple example. Four years ago, I became a dad and I was afraid of holding a newborn in my hands because I feel like I, I'm going to drop this baby. Or I'm going to I'm going to break her and do something silly like I don't want to I'll just play on the bed and I'll th th that's fine. And my wife was encouraging me. No, no, you, you can do this. Don't worry. You're not going to drop the baby. And I was so afraid. And then uh, at a certain point, I, I realized like, you know what? This is. It's uh, it's a choice. It's within my hand. Like I I am not going to drop this baby. It's not okay to drop a baby. So I'm not going to drop a baby no matter what. Like I made that strong decision inside of me. And uh, I never dropped a baby. <laughs> you know, I, it went so deep in my uh, body, in my nervous system, my subconscious mind that I felt I could be walking up the stairs half asleep, you know, and I would still not drop the baby. It just it cannot happen because it's not an option. Nice. And it's, you know, it's a, when you frame your goals, when you frame the change you want to make as I'd like to, that's just a preference. I would like to lose some weight. I'd like to quit my job. I would like to become good at tennis. That's a preference. If you say, I would love to, 
that's a bit stronger, but it's a wish. When you say, I want to, that's stronger. That's a desire. When you say, I must, that's a commitment. Yeah. And stronger than that is saying, I will. I will. Why, why is, it. yeah, I will different from I must? Well, that's just like you play with the words fear and afraid. Yeah. I had to differentiate these different levels of commitment. Yeah, yeah. And if you think of your brain as a, as a big light bulb, the more current you pass through the light bulb, the more light is going to produce. And so when you, I, I would like to do this, it's a very low current. Yeah. I must do this. It's very high current. Yeah. Well, I like your, your new book, Wise Confidence. When's that coming out? That's uh, March 12th, 2024. Nice. Okay. So we'll make sure that in the show notes, people uh, know, you know how to sign up for that early. Hopefully they, they do some pre-sales for you. Um, I, I love the, uh, I love the, the concepts there that, that you're putting out those five, five big ones. Wait, wait, self-belief is number one, right? Integrity. I like your um, definition of being integral, uh, subconscious and conscious. See, that was interesting. The whole body has to be aligned there. Uh, we mm -hmm. talked about courage. Uh, and, and I love that as in confidence, you know, the opposite of fear, right? Uh, optimism. Good on that because, you know, uh, the naysayers that, that, oh, well, you're just, you're polyander, you know, you're only optimist. Um, you gave me the example of a pessimist is always right, but the optimist can be happy or fulfilled. Give me another example when someone says, well, you're just a, a poly, you're Pollyanna about the world right now. You know, what, what what's another way to, to, um, to be self-assured with optimism? The way I see it is um, optimism is more about how you explain things to yourself. Oh, nice. If things if things happened in your life in a way that you didn't expect, you you lost your job the moment that you just got a new mortgage, and you, you can tell yourself like my life is is finished. This is the worst time that this could have happened, and uh, I, it's going to be hard for me to pay this this debt off. You know, you can tell yourself all these yeah. things. That's more pessimistic, and you you may be right. Actually, if you think like this, you will likely be right. Exactly. But if you say oh, like, I, you know I, what? Everything happens for a reason. And so there must be a reason here that I'm still not aware of. Maybe this is the greatest blessing. Maybe this is the push I needed to start my business, to upgrade my career, to go for something bigger. Oh, man, I love that. Okay, that's, that's a takeaway. How to explain things to yourself. That's a beautiful way to, to look at it. Um, ah, I like that. Good. And then determination. We talked a little bit about, about that at the, uh, at the end there, this willpower aspect to things. Um, man, I love your book. I'll be getting it for sure. Uh, hey, two things I want to, I want to kind of wrap up on. One is, um, this idea of, I like morning wake ups. What's your routine when you wake up and, uh, what's your routine when you go to bed? Do you have a routine? <laughs> well, I, I do, but my routine is probably very extreme for most people. Um, I'll, I'll share it, but it, with the caveat that everyone has to find what works for them. Okay. So I wake up at 2.30 in the morning. What time? 2.30. Uh, 2.30. Yes. What time you go to bed? At 9.30. Okay, got it. So I have biphasic sleep. I sleep five hours in the evening and I sleep my two hours at the end of the morning. So I get my seven hours like this. Okay. So I wake up at 2.30 in the morning. I do a little bit of reading while I'm having some tea. Then I have a cold shower. And then I sit for about three hours of meditation. I do uh, 40 to 60 minutes of Kung Fu exercises. Oh, nice. Then I am ready for my day, which means I'm either going into coach mode, if it's the day that I'm coaching people, or into creator mode, if it's the day that I'm writing, recording, uh, reading. And you separate those two. Do you ever do your coaching and your creativity on the same day? So that's how I started in the beginning. And then I implemented this concept called theme days. So I find that this is much, uh, much better way to flow. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I have all my classes coaching and I do project management stuff. Mm -hmm. Then Thursday is the day that I create content. Every Thursday, I'm going to record 10 videos and uh, write one blog post. And Friday is the day that I'm working on product. And that could mean either improving my app or writing another book. 
Oh, nice. Speaking of all the ways to interact with you app wise, you got a blog, right? That's I think the, the number five blog. Uh, what, tell me, tell us what, what are some ways uh, that, that you have found m- m- allow you to transfer your knowledge to people? Okay. So you can follow me on YouTube for a daily shot of mindful self-discipline, wise confidence, meditation. And that's a one minute short every day. You can read my blog at mindfulselfdiscipline.com. That is the latest blog around what we're covering here. And then um, you can get the books. If you are interested in this, um, mindful self-discipline, wise confidence, practical meditation. You can find them wherever you, you find books. And there's also an audiobook version of some of them. Oh, nice. What's the app? Is the app where you get your daily um, mindfulness, self-discipline? Is that where it is? Sure. So the app is um, like a step-by-step program. It gives you all the tools to practice the concepts of mindful self-discipline. So there are some guided meditations. There's a journaling tool. There is a tracker for greater awareness. There are some courses. It's basically a coach in your pocket. Yeah, I see. And is that something that people can get or do you have to subscribe to it? What's what's the what's the way? Yeah, so it's a membership, but you can get a two week free trial. OK, what's it called? Mindful self-discipline. Same. Yeah, everything. Your brand yes. and mindful self-discipline. I got right. it. That's awesome. That's good. Yeah, <laughs> it's all there on the website. OK, uh, awesome. How about um, the other thing is, you know, what are some really deep lessons learned or life mantras or, or quotes um, that you've, you know, over your life have have actually used and want to share? What, what are some of the deeper ones that you live your own life by? So one of these is um, tying up to the idea of determination. And it's this, fill your mind with determination and there would be no place left for self-doubt. Mm, I like that. Fill your mind with determination and there'll be no place left for self-doubt. Yes. I like it. And that's this idea that we, if you are doubting yourself, if you think you will fail, if you are afraid of what's going to happen, if you're anxious about the future, it's because you're not determined. Those thoughts and feelings are occupying the space in your mind that determination should occupy. Nice. Nice. What, um, when you said you almost came a monk, what tradition was that in? That was in Zen Buddhism at that time. I, yeah, I learned Japanese. I traveled to Japan to become a monk there. And in my travel to Japan, I met my wife. So that changed, that was a change of plans. (laughs) Now there's some good karma, right? Or, uh, (laughs) yes, absolutely. Oh, that's, that's good. That's good. Uh, are there, um, this more of a self-reflection mode, the different traditions that you've studied, okay, what are they and how are they more similar than being different? That's where I want to get to. Uh, cause my belief is all these traditions are beautiful. You know, how can we, how can we find the beauty or the commonality, not the differences? So, uh, you've studied a lot, where are you seeing and, and what are the commonalities? So they all um, promote certain ways of thinking and navigating life, certain practices like meditation, like self-reflection. So all of this is in common. They all talk about, you know, karma, that what we do matters and it matters a lot. So we better live mindfully and pay attention because that's what we're going to have. That's going to be our future. Um They have differences about their goals, you know, how they see what is the spiritual goal. Um, They have differences, you know, what language they chant, what uh, clothes they wear, and uh, what books they read, etc. But it's my, my conviction that they all make us a better person. They all make our, our life better. I like that. That's well said. Well said. Uh, I, I, I'm wearing a shirt for those of the who are watching versus listening. It says glad to be here. And uh, that's a deep, deep message. Uh, I think you said it at the beginning of the of, of the podcast. But um, what does glad to be here mean to you? 
it means to show up in your life um, with gratitude and with zest that, you know, I am where I should be. So let me make the best out of this moment. Let me live this moment according to my values and aspirations. And let me have fun along the way too. I love it. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And it plays right into your, your philosophy of self-discipline, presence, awareness. Let's be glad to be here, man. It's, it's <laughs> That's it. Oh, uh, thank you. Giovanni, it's been a, a pleasure and an honor. We're going to call you Lion from now on. <laughs> All right. Thank you, John. It was a pleasure to be here. Glad to be here.